So um, I will call to order this special meeting of the Northampton School Committee on Tuesday, October 20th, 2020. Um, I'm Mayor David Narkowitz, I'm the chair. Um, this meeting is being held pursuant to Governor Baker's emergency order, modifying the state's open meeting law issued March 12th, 2020. Um, this uh, meeting is being audio and video recorded and will be uh, used for future broadcast on Northampton Open Media, um, our local cable access television statement. Um, I would ask that uh, folks uh, be mindful of their uh, microphones and mute their microphones. Um, we will be having a public comment session later um, it will having a public comment uh, session shortly. And in that case, those members of the public who wish to speak in public comment um, would need to use the raise hand function um, to basically queue up to speak in public comment. But let's begin the meeting by asking the clerk to call the roll call of the school committee. Mayor Narquist. Present. Member Busansky. Present. Member Fallon. Present. Member Serafi Cox. Present. Member Condon. Present. Member Levy. Present. Present. Member Kaufman. Present. Member Goldman. Present. Member Voss. Present. And Member Gold. Present. Your Honor, you have a quorum. Okay, thank you. So um, there's basically two items on our agenda this evening. Um, uh, just to give the public uh, an understanding of that, we have an executive session and then we have a discussion and report on recommendations of the Joint Labor Management Committee. Um, before we move to that though, um, we will have our public comment period. Um, this is an opportunity for members of the public to offer any comment to the school committee. Um, we ask you to um, limit your remarks to three minutes and we ask you to state your name and where you live um, uh, for the record when you begin. Um, if you are on Zoom, um, then you can use the uh, raised hand function. Um, if you're calling in by phone, you'll have to use the star functions to, to indicate that you wanna raise your hand. Um, I believe it's star six to raise your hand. So, um, so the first person or the, at this point, the only person who's raised their hand to speak in public comment is uh, Patrick Bowen. Patrick, uh, if you can unmute and um, you'll have the floor for three minutes. All right. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, members of the school committee. My name is Patrick Bowen. I live at 9 Harold Street in Florence. Um, tonight, my understanding is you're going to be presented with the recommendations from the JMLC or JLMC. Um, having listened in to their meeting last night, there was a variable via Zoom and having talked with um, different members of the school committee, um, I wanted to ask that you adopt these recommendations that are being presented to you or is speak in support of adopting them. Um, I also want to comment, I think that tasking the JMLC with this project was the right move for several reasons. Um, it appears they put in hours or days of work to develop these comprehensive regulations and recommendations that the school committee as a whole, I, I don't think has, simply doesn't have time to do along with its other business. Um, this process also allowed the unionized staff members to work collaboratively with the city's medical staff to have real conversation with each other and, and learn together and develop a document that I believe all parties could support. And because of this, I think we, we as a community can leave behind Dr. Google and instead work with these recommendations that were developed based on extensive research by the committee. Um, I also know from my understanding that these recommendations and looking at those in districts across the Commonwealth, that these are still, still fairly conservative recommendations. Um, and perhaps the most conservative I've seen of any districts considering hybrids, so that perhaps will provide some comfort to people who are um, concerned about going back to in-person learning. Um, I also ask that the school committee adopt these regulations at the meeting later this week, 
and move to implement them with urgency. I feel that we are doing real damage to some children in our community with continued remote learning and isolation. So let's move quickly to a more balanced guidance that the JMLC has developed to do better for our children. And I ask that the school committee to continue to use this process and rely on the JMLC and the city's excellent public health director and department for guidance on other issues that remain unresolved at this time and as new issues arrive. Thank you all for your time and your effort and service to the community. Thank, thank you for your comments, Patrick. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak in public comment? Um, if you could use the raised hand function to indicate as much. Um, not seeing anyone else. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, uh, Tim Jones, you have your hand up. Um, if you can please unmute and let us know your name and where you live and I'll keep a timer for three minutes. Um, you're still, still, okay. there you go. I think I'm unmuted. Yeah, we can unmuted? Hear. Yes, we are. Yes, you are. All right, thank you, Mayor. Uh, I'd like to address the uh, process and this is under three minutes. I'd like to address the process that has, uh, occurred over the last seven months while our kids have been out of school. Um, I think this committee uh, has lost sight of its primary constituency, our children, and it has become captive to other interests to the severe detriment of thousands of children and families throughout our community. Here's a glimpse of how the process has gone off the tracks towards arbitrary, irrational decision-making. Our public health director, Meredith O'Leary, has discussed how the schools can and should be open with in-place nuanced, nuanced science-based practices and protocols to protect our community. This is our public health director telling us this, but in our community, her position, her opinion, her expert advice is dismissed. Whereas in other communities, health directors advice is followed. And it's only been rejected for schools and nothing else. Everything is open to a certain extent. In addition to the committee and the JLMC rejecting the health director O'Leary, here are all the other scientific authorities rejected by this committee and the JLMC, a local pediatrician, Dr. Diana Johansson, and a member of the JLMC, the American Academy of Pediatrics, several nurses, and a pandemic expert who provided commentary to this committee or the JLMC brushed aside. Scientific journals urging school openings with masks, distancings, and fans in communities like, with low COVID transmission rates like ours brushed aside. Scientific journals have pointed out that schools have not been super spreaders, which is what O'Leary commented on last night, brushed aside. Several schools around the Commonwealth, about 70 to 80 percent in the world, have been employing successful models. Our school system could have looked to them and modeled an approach after them, brushed aside. The schools could employ synchronous remote learning with simultaneous in-person learning to allow in-person choice and remote learning choice, brushed aside. Instead of taking the above path that is advocating by public health officials, scientists, journals, and doctors, our committee and the JLMC have taken an alternative arbitrary course. Here's why I say that. They negotiated a provision in the memorandum of understanding that relies arbitrarily as pointed out, out, out by O'Leary last night, arbitrarily on uh, measures from other districts. The JLMC negotiated additional compensation for teachers if they teach in person, something almost no other school in the Commonwealth has done to my knowledge. And here's the best one. And this sort of sums it all up for me, how this has gone so far off the tracks. The JLMC is demanding essentially perfect ventilation in every room based upon standards and research that to my knowledge do not, do not account for people wearing masks. In fact, and this is really revealing, at the October 6, 2020 minutes from the NACE board meeting, the minutes state that the level of air exchange they are seeking, this is NACE, our teachers union, the level of air exchange they are seeking is equivalent to an N95 mask. There you have it folks, with that level of protection, our NACE members would not have to wear masks. And while they search for that perfect solution, where are our kids? Our kids continue to suffer during remote learning. I ask you to stop this absurd charade now and get our kids into school. Just like Smith Voke up the street 
just like Long Meadow doing two full days of hybrid learning all around us. East Hampton just opened up. Open up our schools, get the kids in. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your public comments. The next person whose hand is raised is Dylan Boyd. Dylan, if you can um, unmute and uh, tell us your name and where you live. Hi, uh, my name is Dylan Boyd, you said it. Uh, I live at uh, on O'Donnell Drive near Ryan Road School. And um, I don't have a prepared statement. The, the first two clearly wrote something down. I came in ready to um, sort of put my thoughts together while other people spoke, but it doesn't look like there's that many people. I'm speaking about primarily the educational aspects of the decision from my position as a teacher at the high school. Um, I've got 13 years teaching experience eight of which have been at the high school. Um, in the spring, I thought hybrid was a pretty good idea. Uh, I, as we went into the remote learning, I thought, sure, that makes a lot of sense. You know, we could do both, um, you know, something in between. We're all remote would certainly be really hard and there'd be a lot of equity issues. Um, then I had to teach remote and I thought a little bit more about what a hybrid model would look like. I don't have the expertise or the research to talk about the health aspects. Uh, it might be um, healthy and safe. Uh, it might not be. I, I think we don't know for sure, and I won't speak about those details. Educationally, I think we're overlooking so far what I've heard, um, the idea that a hybrid model is not what we think it is. Okay. I don't think a hybrid model is going to be a better educational structure for students. Um, I don't think it's necessarily worse. I think we, can, we I don't know enough to say for certain but um, I can tell you this, that um, teaching in the classroom as it normally was takes all of your attention. Anybody who's run a child's birthday party um, would understand that. Teaching remotely takes um, even more of that. You're, you're not just paying attention to your senses. It's strictly just what's coming in through your screen. It's very difficult. The idea that we might be able to do both simultaneously is, uh, is, is a mistake, uh, to, to put it kindly. Um, I think add to this the idea that uh, a remote learning experience versus a hybrid learning experience would involve in more disruptions. As soon as somebody gets sick, those people quarantined will not be able to come into the, into the building. Uh, if a teacher gets sick, that class, we no longer have subs. Um, we were short on subs before this, we're even more short on subs now, and they certainly can't do what we're doing now. I combine this with the fact that students might be in the building, um, it's not what you think it's going to be, I don't think. I, I don't mean to uh, presume what you're imagining, but um, sitting at individual desks eight feet apart is not what classrooms look like now. They'll all have masks on. And you think that's a very healthful idea. Um, it's hard to imagine what it looks like when you have to talk to somebody and you can't see their face. You can't see with their mouth. You can't see if they're smiling at you. It's very challenging to understand what that experience is like. So the being in the building is not going to be a better situation. I'm not saying it's gonna be worse. I'm saying the transition needs to be carefully considered and that side of it needs to be considered as well. Um, I don't, th I think we starting to find a rhythm in what we are doing now. And I admit that there are problems and it's difficult for certain families. Having found that rhythm, uh, I worry about what the transitions will be like. And yes, we'll do one transition to hybrid and then several other transitions as people will fall sick from this as they have in every other school that's been hybrid, which will force some people into quarantine and there will be repeated other smaller, yes, but present disruptions that we're not dealing with now. Um, my personal opinion is that the anxiety will go up, concerns will go up, and uh, for little benefit. Thank you for, uh, for listening. Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dylan. The next person who is, has their hand raised is Ellen McGrath. Hi, my name is, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, my name is Ellen McGrath, and I live at 22 Washington Ave in Northampton. And I just wanted to speak a little bit um, quickly about about the numbers. I don't know if people know this, maybe they do, but our, our county and actually Northampton and the surrounding towns are all, all the towns that are touching North or contiguous to Northampton are in the range that the CDC is saying is the lowest risk of transmission passing in schools. So I just think that's important to note. And I also know that people are saying, you know, there's school of choice. I've heard this brought up. 98% of our students, including Northampton residents and school of choice, 98% are in towns 
that have um, very the lowest risk you could have. Um, and that being said, I attended the JLMC meeting last night and you know, I was looking at it this way. And then we heard from our director of public health, Meredith O'Leary, that that actually is not even a good way to look at it. And that what we should be doing is looking at transmission in schools versus towns, because there could be an outbreak in a nursing home that would put Northampton into the red, even for example, or at the jail, and that would not affect our children. We shouldn't close down schools for that. So again, I just wanted to speak a little bit to, to the numbers that, um, you know, our area, the surrounding towns. And I get what Dylan Boyd is saying to address what he said, that it may not be the same, but I do not think that most kids can learn this way. And I think they need to be in person. And I think, I, I agree, it's hard to listen to someone with a mask, but we're all starting to get used to it. I mean, I know I'm more used to it than I was seven months ago. It's not perfect, but also I'm a parent, I have to work. So my 13 year old, is alone every day in his room doing remote learning by himself. My husband and I have to work. So I think it's healthier perhaps even to just be with other people. Maybe they get a mask break. Maybe they you know, just see other people. I don't think it's healthy for him to literally be in his room all day. And I think the numbers, if we're looking at the data, we keep saying we wanna look at data, our rates are as low as they're gonna get. I think there's zero, you know, there's zero people in the hospital here. Um, and like I said, Northampton and all its surrounding towns, um, besides um, someone could quote Holyoke, but again, Meredith O'Leary, our, our expert in this field, said um, last night that really we should be looking at the transmission in the school, not the transmission in the surrounding towns. Thank you. Thank you, Ellen, I appreciate that. The next person who signed up to speak is Catherine Ames. Hi there, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, hi there, my name is Catherine Ames and I live at 207 Crescent Street. Um, I have a freshman at Northampton High School and a seventh grader at JFK. Um, and I'd like to speak to the meeting that was held last night with the Joint Labor Management Committee. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the community member who called out the committee and expressed concern over the open meeting law. Um, this committee is making huge decisions for our kids and has been meeting since June. And I'm not sure why the public wasn't made aware of this sooner. Um, last night's meetings was a discussion around recommendations that the JLMC will be making to the school committee with regard to health and safety measures as it relates to sending our kids back to school in person. Um, as others have said, Meredith O'Leary, the director of the Department of Public Health in Northampton, and Dr. Diana Johansson, uh, the district physician and pediatrician, and Kate Kelly, a school nurse and Northampton public school parent, all agreed wholeheartedly that our kids should be in school in person. While the two teachers on the committee tried their hardest to put together a scenario which would warrant either continued remote learning or a shutdown, all three healthcare professionals talked about the science and the data in our community that fully supports in-person learning. It was almost contentious. I am completely baffled by the fact that the teachers and the union, NACE, um, and certain school committee members refuse to listen to our healthcare professionals when it comes to health and safety and bringing our kids back to school. In August, when the initial vote happened to go hybrid, we heard the same healthcare, healthcare experts say that it was safe for our kids to be in school in person, but the school committee voted to go remote. And I get it, that was based on fear. We didn't know what was going on then, but it's frustrating as a community member to think that the people making the decisions about our children's education and our future are not listening to the experts and they're not following the data in our community in specifically in Northampton. Our numbers are low and they've been low for months. Um, the conversation last night turned to ventilation in our schools, which, Again, I obviously, you know, we're going to look at that. Um, when I look at the CDC mitigation guidelines and compared them to the very, very low numbers in Northampton, it seems that the air purifiers that were all purchased and are supposedly some sitting in classrooms waiting um, for each class in the district, along with all of the PPE that was purchased for staff members, should keep us safe. 
We've learned that if we wear a mask, we socially distance, wash our hands and sanitize, it works. Our community has proven that with our very low numbers. In fact, Cooley Dickinson hasn't had a positive case of COVID since September 6th. I simply do not understand why the teachers, certain school committee members in the union don't have the best interest of our kids in mind and aren't thinking of every way possible to send our kids back to school. Um, in a safe way, we can do this safely. The rest of the world is back to work. Our community members are back to work. The only people that seem to not want to go back to work in person are the schools and the NACE community, I hate to say it. Um, the conversation is always around what's safe for the teachers and the staff and not what's in the best interest of the students and the caregivers. And that conversation needs to shift. Um, finally- You could just wrap up, that's the three minutes. You could just- I'll I'll wrap up with my biggest issue from last night's meeting and that the final edit of the recommendation document was done after Meredith O'Leary and Dr. Johansson had left the call. That's unacceptable. Every other school committee, or I'm sorry, committee member was asked to shout out if they saw anything that was, um, that they were uncomfortable with in, in the document. And those two people, the experts in their field and what we're dealing with were not there. This is not fair balance. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you very much for your comments this evening. The next person who signed up is Marnie Anderson. Marnie, you can unmute. Yes. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you. I'm at 24 Western Avenue in Northampton. I want to echo the voices of so many parents tonight and say that this has been absolutely devastating for my fourth grader. Um, and I think I mean, all children, but especially elementary school children. It's true that a hybrid model would not be the same. There would be masks, there would be distancing, but my daughter is willing to do pretty much anything. Any school is better than no in-person school. I hear a lot of what if, what if, I hear a lot of why things won't work, why tents won't work, why this won't work. I wanna know what can work. I've been listening to Joseph Allen, which I understand the JMLC has been who's they've been consulting. He's an epidemiologist at Harvard. And I'd, I'd like to close with his words from last week. He says, kids out of school, and I'm talking K through 12, is a national emergency and it is not being treated as such. The conversation on schools has gotten very reductionist in terms of in-classroom risk. That risk is important, but it can actually be managed. And very few are talking about the risks of kids being out of school. That's the end of the quote, and I'm appealing to you to figure out a way to get our kids back in school, imperfect though it may be. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the next person who has their hand up to speak is uh, Tara Orzolek. Orzolek. Hi. Go ahead, Tara. Um, I just can you just let us wanted, know you just let us know where you live I live at Four School Street in Northampton and I am a parent and I also have a seventh grader at JFK and a ninth grader at NHS. Um, and I just wanted to echo basically everything that all of the other parents have said. Um, they've expressed it pretty much everything I wanted to say. Um, I had a quote in the paper the other day, it was anonymous, but it was me. And I also have written letters to every school member. Only three of the school committees have members have written me back by the way. But, um, and thank you for those members responses. But um, I just wanted to echo that yes, my kids need school, they want school. It does not make any sense why the rest of the community is opened up and yet the schools are closed. It's hypocritical and it's shameful. Um, I read today that Ireland is has a spike in um, cases. Ireland has closed pretty much everything in their country except their schools. Ireland has kept their schools open because they recognize the importance of this. Um, I think in other European countries, it's been the same. New York City has a hybrid model, New York City, which has obviously just, um, you know, much larger population, greater density, people going on subways, traveling, all sorts of things. I think, and I also, you know, want to emphasize that I don't think it's just elementary school kids. 
kids. I think it's also middle school kids and high school kids. My daughter started high school this year remotely. Um, this is the year when she's learning to become an adult, a responsible citizen, learning to have serious conversations, learning to be um, a, conscient, a, a conscious citizen and uh, someone who can contribute to the community. They need, um, they need in person. And even if it's just one day, um, my daughter recently just started up her piano lessons again, socially distant. Her piano teacher sits farther than six feet away from her. They both have masks on. She said, despite that, it was so much better. It was so much better than trying to do it over Zoom. And um, there's a woman who, a mother who said that her child was in a room all day. I mean, I think most parents here do work. Most parents are doing their stuff, even if they're in another room on their computer. We, we are basically checking up with our kids. It's very hard. And I think our kids know at this point, we live in a good community. We live in a community that respects science and that is well-educated. And I think we all educate our kids in turn. They know they have to wear masks. They can't be with close um, to other you know, people, they know the protocol, they're educated, they watch um, social media, everyone knows what's going on in the world. So just to say, I, I, we cannot live our life on what if, we don't know when this will be over, we don't know when a vaccine will be widely distributed or implemented. And I think we must transition and the, we must be flexible. We're gonna get happy, get used to, you know, corona, coronavirus days, like school days or snow days. And that's, it'll just be the future. But I it's believe time. we have to, so thank you. Thank you, thank you for finishing up. Um, the next person who has their hand up is Mary Demarath. Mary? Hi, my name is Mary Demarath. I am a special ed teacher at BSS. And I just want to remind everybody today that we are serving some of the kids in our community. We are serving some of the most vulnerable kids in our community at Bridge Street School and other schools around the district. Um, I am at Bridge Street every day uh, from the morning bell until after the afternoon bell. We have ELL students. We have uh, students without homes and we have special ed students. Um, I love being able to go to school every day and every day I'm taking a risk by going to school. Every day I'm working with kids who don't tolerate masks or understand what they're for. Um, every day I find myself helping a student access technology uh, within mm, an 18 inch range from their face. Um, I find every day that I have kids maybe who are having a hard time and melting down. Um, and they need an adult to get close to them. Um, I live with a high risk person and I have um, a high school senior at home who's doing school every day home alone. So um, I just want everyone to remember that we are serving kids in our community. We are only as strong as our most vulnerable members. We are only as healthy as our least healthy community members. Um, and that there's no way to make this better. This situation stinks. There isn't an easy solution. Getting mad at teachers isn't the solution. Getting mad at the school committee isn't the solution. Our nation is in crisis. And the sacrifice that we have to make is that some of us are willing to be in person with kiddos and risk being sick. And some of us find that really scary and wanna stay home. And teachers are human beings with fears that maybe aren't always based on numbers. Um, but we hear stories every day of teacher friends in other communities who are ill or who have died. Um, and we're people who get scared, just like you. So I just want to remind you that community members and kids in our community who are most vulnerable are being served. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the next person whose hand is raised is Melissa Madison. Thank you once again.
So mayor, superintendent, and school committee members, thank you all for the time you have spent in meetings. I have truly come to appreciate it as I have sat in on many, many hours of these meetings as well. I think I have more questions tonight than comments perhaps. And I would gladly give my minutes up if anybody would answer this question. When do you anticipate we will return to school? And again, I will gladly give up my time if the mayor, the provost, a school committee member or the union president would be would answer that question because this is a pandemic it's not going away we're about to enter endemic times and i'm wondering when you think we're going back to school so as you may or may not be well, you said you've attended many of our meetings but we the public comment time is is designed not to be interactive it's really the public makes comment and and we listen it's your time to speak not our time to speak um i know that items on this agenda and on Thursday's agenda, I think speak to your uh, question, but I really, we really don't respond or can't do Q and A or in public comment. So do you have more to say or do you sure. wish? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry for that, that nobody can answer that question. And I've asked in several um, emails as well and I haven't gone and responded. But we are living in a time of pandemic and we'll soon need to realize we are in an endemic and need to figure out how to adjust to our new normal. This is not going away anytime soon. Our children will be out of school one year and just a few short months. The stalling we have seen is disheartening. I work at Western New England University. I talked five hours today, face to face in a lab. In the spring, it was announced by our president that we would return in the fall. The students had spoken loud and clear and wanted to be in person. A committee was convened and we met weekly on plans to reopen. We were nervous, but realized this pandemic was not going away anytime soon. This is our eighth week of being open at Western New England University. The university has had 12 positive cases to date, six resolved, six current. The schedule was changed. We are closing. The schedule was changed in the summer. We are closing right before Thanksgiving to reduce possible transmission. We'll have study days and take remote exams. Why can we not implement anything like this? And it's too late to say, why didn't we? Why didn't we? Why didn't we? I think we need to ask, why are we not in school right now? Hatfield has been in school se se since September 28th. How many cases do you think they've had? How many cases have we had now that our at-risk learners have been in school? So if it's working for some of our average students, why, why can we not get our students back in? Those who want to go, that's all I have to say. Thank you so much. Um, the next person who is signed up to speak or raise their hand to speak rather is John Galvin. John, go ahead. And... Great, thank you, Mayor Narkowitz. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great. First of all, Mayor Narkowitz, I want to let you know I'm a supporter or a voter. The people on this call are also voters and supporters and we've been there when you've had to manage challenging times with our budget and we appreciate it. And now is a time where we need you to manage what's going on with the JLMC and the broader school committee. I'm gonna start with a quote from Anthony Fauci and it was in a conversation he gave to the American Federation of Teachers, the largest teachers union and he said the default situation should be that we should try to the best of our ability to get the children back to school. This was July 29th, 2020. This is not about Monday morning quarterbacking. We've known what the science is. We've known what the data is for months and yet we have squandered this time. As the school committee, you have one job right now that the voters want you to execute on. We want you to get these children back to school. We want you to enable these teachers to be the heroes that they should be. We're in a crisis and we need you to act on it. I want to speak specifically to the JLMC. There's three really critical issues. Sounds like somebody may have mentioned this before I jumped on. The Joint Labor Management Committee is a bit of a euphemism. It is a labor committee. There is no management on this committee. There's a member of the 
school committee who operates as a, a de facto member of labor. The, it is principally teachers and when they produce their results as we've heard tonight, they disregard the advice of the medical community that, it, they, that is presented in the meeting. Secondly, they disregard the science. My former neighbor, Marnie, quoted Joseph Allen, who is a professor of exposure assessment science at Harvard School of Public Health. His job is to study what's going on in school buildings. I'm gonna mention another quote from him from an article that was published in the Harvard Gazette just earlier this week. When the metrics are met, as they have been in Massachusetts, but schools in some districts stay closed, I think that's a problem. If they don't open when community spread is low and where the weather has been perfect for the past two months and school buildings are ready, when will they open? Alan went on to say, these are devastating consequences. There are devastating consequences from kids being out of school. This is a national emergency. We are not overstating it. The third point, besides not being a management committee, not for disregarding this available science from the best minds in the country, is that this committee has been operating in violation of our open meeting law in this state. There is an elected representative on the committee. There is no excuse for this. I had a long conversation today with Pam Powers. By the way, Pam Powers, city clerk, is an excellent office holder. Pam Powers for president. We reviewed the meetings and the agenda for the JLMC. She is sending a letter tonight. She believes you are operating outside of the law with your agenda. These agendas are a joke. I have one for tomorrow. Call to order. That's, um, that's time, John. So we're at three minutes right now. And let me just close where I started. You have one job, get these kids back to school disband the JLMC. It is not serving your interest school committee members. And let's get these kids back to school. Thank you. Uh, the next uh, person whose hand is raised is Carrie Nykerchuk. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. When this school committee convened in August or September, when the first decision was made, whether to send the kids back to school in person, by hybrid, or by remote. The union stacked the entire public comment session and used nothing but fear tactics and scare and scare tactics to tell the school committee that if they sent these kids back to school, people were gonna die. I can't tell you how many times I've heard the people from the union and other teachers who don't have the best interest of our students at heart using death and the fact that they are scaring people and saying people are gonna die. I think that is beyond irresponsible. It is the job of the school committee first and foremost to represent the students, not the union and not the teachers. It is the job to take care of our kids. I have kids in third grade and sixth. They have not had a full day of school yet. So member Kaufman, in the last meeting, you scoffed at saying and smirked when you said, oh, the kids have only been in school for three weeks. You're right, they have only been in school for three weeks, but you know what? They should have been in school for much, much longer. But because we had to give the teachers and the union two weeks to prepare, they also missed another two days. Then they missed a day. They've missed so many days, I honestly can't even keep track. Um, so I'm very upset at how you scoffed at that. So I needed to call you out personally on that. Um, we listen to Anthony Fauci and the CDC and Governor Baker for everything about this epidemic. We've listened to them, we've followed their recommendations as well as the American Pediatric Association. How come we're not now? School committee, tell me, why are we not following the science and the numbers? I feel like I'm arguing with Trump's administration, honestly, because it feels to me like the same argument. 
Instead of accepting fear tactics, please, I'm begging you on behalf of our students, listen to the numbers, listen to the facts and listen to the science and please do your jobs for the student, not the union. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie. Uh, the next person who has signed up or raised their hand to speak is Michael Stein. Michael, if you can unmute and let us know your name and where you live. And for folks, I, I ask people to say their name because sometimes the name that's on the Zoom meeting isn't the actual name of the person. So if they're using a partner's account or something. So just could you just state it for the record so it's on the record. Sure, happy to. Uh, my name is Michael Stein. I live in uh, 14 Columbus Avenue, Northampton. I have um, twins in first grade at Bridge Street. Um, and I'm, I'm going to save some comments I have about the hybrid plan for Thursday's meeting ahead of the vote because I'm just um, really sort of uh, overwhelmed and alarmed by all the vitriol I'm hearing. I feel like I'm at a Trump rally. Um, instead of lock it up, it's open it up. And the amount of disrespect being hurled at the teaching staff, at the school committee, at the JLMC is extremely out of line. And I wish there was half as much vitriol being hurled at local, federal, and, and state leadership, you know, state leadership, you know, the position that the school committee in, they shouldn't be in. And they're making extremely difficult decisions. And you can make arguments based on many metrics about whether or not this is safe. And there's broader questions about whether or not this is the right decision for Northampton schools at this time. And I understand everyone's angry. I'm angry. I'm frustrated with the pandemic. I'm frustrated with the major economic depression. I'm frustrated with everything. But the school cannot fix all of that. And demonizing union workers who have a right to organize and have a right to negotiate their working conditions with the state, well, I'm mean, sorry, with the town and have done so in a responsible and proactive manner, as the mayor and everyone else on the school committee said, is ludicrous to me. And what I have experienced is teachers working tirelessly trying to provide a virtual education for our children, relearning how to do their entire jobs every day. And now we may be about to ask them to figure out how to do it all over again, just so we can get two days of partial in-school learning and three days of at-home self-directed learning, which I'm sure you're all gonna complain about then. This is an impossible situation with a lot of bad choices. And it's not as clear as everyone here wants to make it seem. And it's not the case that there's some unionized contingent of teachers that are fear-mongering, right? We've lost almost 10,000 people in the state to COVID. We have red zones all around us and the leadership at Bay State and other hospitals is preparing for a second wave. So I don't think we should pretend that everything is so clear cut and cherry pick metrics and data and try to make bold arguments just because we don't want our kids in our house anymore and we want them to get what they need. We all want them to get what they need, but that doesn't mean you make a decision that could endanger the most vulnerable in the community, could force teachers to quit or retire early and quite frankly, put us in a condition where we can only serve people that are safe and healthy enough or come from households that are healthy enough to go to the hybrid plan and leave the rest to fend for themselves. So I hear a lot of vitriol. I hear a lot of anger. I'm angry too, but this, this anti-union stuff, the anti-teacher stuff, the anti-school committee stuff is way off the mark. And especially coming from you know, what we have for polling, only 38% of people want the hybrid plan versus 40% who want virtual and then a bunch in the middle. It's not as if there's some huge mandate on the mayor or the school committee to take direction from that contingent. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael, for your comments. Uh, the next person whose hand is raised is uh, Melissa Lozeski. Hi, my name is Melissa Lozeski and I live at 45 Acrebrook Drive in Florence. I did not prepare to talk tonight, so forgive me, but I just wanted to speak up and, and um, just briefly say that I have three children. Um, my children are four years old, six years old, and eight year old, and I have all boys, and we have all three of them at home right now trying to do homeschool. Um, two are on IEP for speech, um, and one has ADD. So it has been very interesting in our house trying to get any work done. Um, my six-year-old probably attends school for about two hours a day. Um, my eight-year-old does okay. And then the four-year-old is, is doing nothing pretty much except for speech and singing songs. Um, but I really, 
I am incredibly pro teacher. And I just want to say that, like, I think that we need to figure out a situation where the teachers are comfortable going back into the classroom. Our teachers are incredible at Ryan Road School. I can't say enough about the teachers and enough about the community. Um, you know, our principal came over because our six year old was up in the tree to try to get him out of the tree to get him to go to class. So <laughs> that's the sort of community that we live in. Um, I also just want to say that I'm a nurse practitioner. I work um, at UMass where we've had, you know, an incredible amount of positive cases. Um, and it's been challenging. It's been really challenging. Um, but I, that being said, I am, um, I am very much pro having my kids go back to in-person school because I feel like they're not getting what they need at home right now um, with the two having IEPs and the other one just, it, none of them are able to get their classes done. And um, I feel like they're suffering um, by having this remote school right now. So um, I think that the benefit of them being back in school is much better than what we have right now. So that's it. Thank you, Melissa. Thanks for your comments. Uh, the next person whose hand is raised is Erin McDonald. Erin, you can go ahead and unmute. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. My name is Erin McDonald. I live at 155 West Hampton Road in Florence. Um, it's of great concern to me that our local health expert spoke last night loud and clear to the fact that our community health metrics support a return to in-person learning. And it just sounds like no one is listening. Instead, it feels like we've been victim to the dysfunction and divisiveness of the very public bodies that are supposedly working in the best interest of our kids. Instead, city leaders have debated trick-or-treating policy and the fate of our local restaurants, but schools remain closed and just don't seem to be a priority, despite the guidance from our local experts that's been communicated over and over and over again. We're supposed to be a community that values education, creative thinking, innovation, and equity. But the actions of our district leaders reflect none of those attributes. It was great to hear Mr. Boyd speak out loud about some things maybe that should be um, implemented in school before hybrid starts. These are things that should have been thought of, issues that should have been raised a really long time ago. And unfortunately, there's just been so much dysfunction and again, divisiveness that's gotten in the way of these things being hammered out, things that every other district has been doing. Unfortunately, Mr. Boyd also expressed the things would be done, all of these things to go back hybrid would be to little benefit. And I think what all of us parents have said here tonight is, that the benefits of in-person learning are indisputable, irrefutable. And we've, we all agree that any in-person learning for our children at this point is better than none. Finally, I would like to say, we're all relearning our jobs. We're all going to work and taking on some risk every day. There's no activity right now that has zero risk and there won't be for a really long time, but it should be a high priority of any community to get our kids back to school. We're woefully behind in the planning compared to other districts. Yet our timeline has been the same as everyone's, right? We've been at this since March. We're not an example of a best practice to anyone and, Western Massachusetts, Hampshire County or beyond. We're a worst case scenario. And in closing, I would just like to say all children should by, be prioritized at this point in time to return to in-person learning. There's just no more time. My son is a junior and thinking about college. How is he going to make up the ground that's already been lost by remote learning and what little time he has left in high school? There's just no more time for phased in approaches or things that will keep our kids out of the classroom for any more time. The health metrics show it's the time is now to go back. Our children need to be back in the classroom. And I really hope that all the powers that be, all the groups that are working so hard in the midst of this pandemic can come together and find a way to make that happen. Thank you. Thank you, Erin. Thank you very much. The um, next person who has their hand raised is uh, Michelle Sullivan. Oh, yay. Um, hi, I'm Michelle Sullivan. I live on Ryan Road. My daughter is in ninth grade. 
Um, and I am a teacher, um, early childhood educator. My husband's a high school teacher in a different school district. I've been back in person with my children since August. Uh, my children I teach, not the ones that I had. Um, my husband has been back on a hybrid plan since um, late September, early October. Um, I wasn't planning on speaking, but it was very hard to listen to so much anger and shouting about this. This is terrible. Like it's a rotten situation. There's absolutely no denying that. It feels like fingers are being pointed and they're being pointed at teachers. I understand that this is really important. Um, but my experience being in person with children is that in order for it to work, I've really had to work with the parents of the children that have been in my care. I've really needed to feel like they have my back, that they're not going to send their children to school when they're sick, um, and that I can trust them. I feel that the, the, the anger and the vitriol that's been spouted is being inappropriately directed. I wanna say thank you to the teachers and the school committee and everybody who's been busting their butts to try and make an impossible situation work in a way that is intelligent and safe and can work for everybody. It's, it's an impossible task. Um, but can I just ask that people take a breath and be kind and respectful. Um, I also feel really strongly that having this conversation without access to free universal testing, no matter how many metrics you pull up, we're in a place where we're operating without a important piece. People need to feel that they can get that piece of real information in order to have like an idea of what's going on in the school building that you're working in. If no one is has access to testing, um, you don't really know what you're working with. And that's it. Thank you so much, Michelle. Um, the next person who is signed up is um, uh, Bridget Pinsenault. Bridget, if I'm go ahead and unmute. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, Hi I'm Bridget Pinsenault. Um, I live on Sandy Hill Road in Florence and I'm a school. Um, I wasn't really prepared to speak tonight, but I just felt after hearing everything, I just felt like I had to say something. Um, I'm speaking to say that a hybrid model, I believe, would be a disservice to the education of the students in North Northern Public Schools, and I'll tell you why. Um, for my profession, I've worked in education for over 20 years now. I currently work for an educational company that oversees various charter schools throughout the United States and worldwide. However, on my part of it, I'm looking at schools throughout the United States, K through 12. So a huge part of my job is similar to that of an instructional coach where I'm constantly observing classes and working with teachers on how they can improve their skills, things like that. So. I have been observing classes across the country for this past month now, and I've seen both hybrid and remote models. And I can confidently say that remote models are a far better option for educating our students. I feel like education is getting lost here. I feel like this has become a debate of childcare, whether people want to admit it or not. I feel like caregivers want to send their children into the building. I apologize if I'm offending anyone by saying that. But it seems to be to me. If we clearly are looking at it from an educational perspective, what is the best education for our students? Is it five days a week with their teacher? Or is it two days a week in person with their teacher and three days of some sort of independent learning? whatever is supposed to be happening on the three remote days. I think that Northampton Public Schools has put together an extremely strong remote learning program. I think that it is vastly different from what we saw in March. 
And if I were to compare the classes that my children are enrolled in that I see while I'm working from home and I'm obviously observing their classes as well, they are exceptional. It's absolutely an excellent education. So I really ask you all to think about the educational aspect of this. I know obviously there's a huge health portion of it, but we know we're in a pandemic. There are things going on. Um, I've, I've seen schools just today. I had to speak with a couple of teachers who are quarantining at home because they were obviously not in Northampton in another state, but they were out of student in their class with COVID. Um, so how do you have enough substitutes for this? Because it's gonna happen. It's not really an if, it's a when. Just one student getting COVID Various teachers are usually in contact with a student during the school day. So how are you going to have those teachers out for 14 days and then provide the instruct in school? So you're at time, Bridget. So if you could just finish your final sentence, you're at three minutes. Okay, so I would just say that really, when the students are ready to go in for a full five days, I'm all for it. Yes, get them back in the building. But until that time, let's have our strong five days of remote education and get our children educated. Teachers are here to educate. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the next person who is uh, has their hand raised, I believe is Elizabeth Bowen. Elizabeth? Hi, I'm Elizabeth Bowen. I live on Harold Street in um, Florence. Um, I am both a parent and a teacher um, in the district. Um, I want to sort of open by saying that Unions are really important. And I don't think that that should get lost in people's very justifiable anger. I've worked um, in addition to the Northampton Public Schools. I've also worked at an area charter school. And in addition to my own working conditions, I think that parents really underestimate how important the union is in how honest uh, your child teacher can be in an IEP eligibility meeting. Um, there are a million things that impact kids that unions facilitate and they're really, really important. That being said, um, I think that the criticism that we've handled this poorly in um, comparison to surrounding districts is accurate. Um, I think that the accusation that parents just want childcare um, is not consistent with my experience with the parents that I've talked to. If anything, the parents of my students that I've talked to are significantly underestimating how much education their children are losing right now. Um, we have significant waiting lists for children who are in that uh, population that is supposed to be um, served. I don't know, maybe Bridge Street doesn't have um, waiting list, but we have significant numbers of children who are on those super vulnerable lists who are not receiving in-person services. Um, I'm <laughs> the open meeting law issues that you see here with the school committee are not new. Um, whether through um, purpose on purpose or just from lack of understanding of open meeting law. Um, being just this side of the law has been a consistent um, issue for the um, this school committee and the school committee preceding it, um, actually. Um, I think that the idea that the school committee member on the um, uh, JLMC was, hand, was specified should be a red flag. Um, I think that that the other school committee members involved in the school committee ne member named in that should be reflecting on whether or not that was okay. I think that we're making a bad situation worse by drawing this out. This conversation should have happened two weeks ago. And a lot of the anger that I think we're seeing is this feeling that people are refusing to make a decision. 
Um, I think there, there are a lot of people in the middle who could live with a decision, but the idea that we're refusing to make one um, is very, very stressful for families. And I wanna reiterate that I do think that parents are actually underestimating how much education is being lost in this model for students who are still learning to read. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Elizabeth. The um, next person, um, possibly the final person with their hand raised is Claire Lobdell. Claire? Hi, uh, thanks, Mayor. Um, I, uh, my name is Claire Lobdell, I live on Fairview Avenue. I have two children at Bridge Street School. Um, I, I think the academics is going fine for them, but I wanted to speak specifically to the experience of my younger child who's six. Um, I just really ask you to bring them back for at least hybrid, at least the youngest kids, at least for hybrid. I know her teachers on this call, again, I, she, the, the academics are fine, but my six-year-old is, is so lonely. That social emotional aspect, that's just so critical to their development. She's not getting, and she's melting down every day in a way that she, like, that's new. That's not something that we experienced before, or at least not, you know, since she got out of toddlerhood, they, they just, they need to be around other kids, even if it's at a distance with a mask on. Um, it's, it's so tough. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. So that uh, seems to be the last of the folks who've raised their hand um, to speak in public comment. Um, thank you everyone for participating in the public comment this evening. Um, so we have um, on our agenda uh, two items. Um, the first is a, an executive session. The second is a discussion and a report on recommendations of the JLMC. Um, given that we have so many folks here on the call, um, I'd actually like to move forward, unless there's any objection from school committee, um, to having the report, uh, discussion and report recommendations of the JLMC first and then do the executive session after. This originally had been a meeting plan for an executive session and um, because the report was finished in time to be added to this agenda, we added it to this agenda. So. Um, I'd like to take that up first. And with that, I would turn to um, our representative on that committee, uh, um, Member Voss. Thank you, Mayor. I believe the chair of the JLMC is going to make the presentation. Oh, sorry about that. Sorry, the agenda said, um, had your name. Yeah, no, I understand. Yep. We discussed it at the meeting last night. And if it's okay with you, I think that was the preference. Okay, certainly. So we'll we'll then um, ask the chair to make that presentation. I'm trying to see if I can find the chair. Hi, I'm right here. Oh, sorry, sorry, Lisa, I couldn't see you. Um, I've got. Do I have sharing capabilities for the PowerPoint that I sent? Uh, Annie can. Um, I think Annie can grant those to you, or make you a co-host, Annie. Yes, I will do that. I am trying to find her. Yeah, it took me a while. Okay, I just made you a co-host, Lisa. Okay. And you should be able to share your screen. And, whoops, where'd everybody go? Hang on, technical difficulties. <clears throat> There we go. Is everyone able to see the screen? Yes. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so uh, this is the JLMC report and recommendations for the school committee meeting October 20, 2020. Just starting with a little bit of background. Um, the spread of COVID-19 caused by the virus SARS-CoV-2 in March of 2020 resulted in school closures and a transition to remote learning. At that time, eight teams were formed by district leadership to plan for school reopening and they were working groups. 
A pandemic response team was one of them, and it can, included myself, school nurses, nurse liaison from our local health department's contract tracing team, two teachers, clerical members, director of public health, Northampton public health nurse, district schools physician, and our preschool partnership coordinator. This team's original mission was to create health and safety protocols for the district, trainings for staff, students, and families for in-person learning and care. This team developed health and safety updates to school committee, uh, the school community, staff daily checklist form and procedure, family and student daily checklist form and procedure, COVID-19 school staff training, Mass Department of EEC reopening for preschool plans for Northampton Public Schools, and preschool parent orientation for COVID safety, just to name a few items. The PRT was also on hand to support other teams uh, as, as an example, helping with transportation and consultation, frequency of cleaning needed for classroom materials, explanation of contact tracing and how this supports school safety. In early September, the PRT was renegotiated to become the Pandemic Response Team Dash Joint Labor Management Committee, JLMC, adding on new members, including additional teaching staff, ESP staff, and school committee member. The team's new mission was now to define the overarching metrics make rec and make rec recommendations that could guide the district through remote, hybrid, and in-person phases. We have two recommendations this week, uh, evening. Our first recommendation, the JLMC recommends that the school committee adopt two sets of metrics, health metrics and safety metrics. One set are the health metrics that will guide when any in-person learning may take place, be paused or halted altogether. Please note this is inclusive of whether the in-person learning is occurring with special populations during the remote phase, in the hybrid phase, or during the fully in-person phase in the district. The second set of guidance the JLNC recommends are safety metrics, which guide practices on how to mitigate risk of COVID transmission during any level of in-person learning. Rationale behind this, based on the following points, the situation is fluid and it is critical that the district has the flexibility to responsibly and responsively update procedures and policies to help prevent community spread and support contact tracing Institutions such as schools provide a more structured framework for risk mitigation versus informal settings. And thirdly, determining safe spaces for learning depends on three factors. Health and safety, such as access to hygiene, hand washing and masking, ventilation, air exchange and flow, physical social distancing, square footage and room design. And to tie it all together as an example, a range of air exchange rates to fold into an assessment of access to hygiene and room layout. The health metrics will guide when any in-person learning may take place, be paused or halted altogether as noted. A disclosure, the current members of the JLMC are not experts in epidemiology or HVAC. Our local Board of Health may recommend temporary closure of school and remote learning for a period of time, depending on the level of COVID-19 school transmission. Our local Board of Health will call to order a meeting with the JLMC when area, county, city, and or town rates may have an impact on our community. The JLMC will, will meet weekly for the remainder of the school year on Wednesday evenings from 6.30 on with the intention and commitment to consult with the Board of Health Director and Public Health Nurse regarding the health metrics outlined on the next slides. <clears throat> when meeting with the Director of Public Health, we will be reviewing current cases as we have been doing relative impact, impact of the area towns community transmission, status of the, our public health infrastructure. So our health metrics will guide any in-person learning on an average daily case rate over the last 14 days in the green. If it's less than four cases per 100,000, we are in-person learning, continue to monitoring uh, county and community data. Less than five reported cases in the last 14 days in the gray, we are in in-person learning, continuing to monitor county and community data. As we move to the yellow phase, uh, we are looking at four to eight cases per 100,000. 
The JLMC will meet within 24 hours to make recommendations for in-person learning pause with the board, uh, local board of health input and community and county data. If there is a low community risk, there's no pause. If there's a high community risk, we will pause. And if we get into the red zone with cases greater than uh, eight per 100,000, again, we will meet within 24 hours with the local board of health and looking at the community data. If there's a low community risk, there will be no pause. If there's a high community risk, there will be pause. Just a point of practice, uh, the state DPH numbers are released on Wednesdays, generally around six, sometimes later. Um, from our earlier statement, we are already committed to have, um, and we've set up a system to assure that the JLMC will meet within that set 24 hour period. This is a, a decision-making tool. Again, it's fluid. It will most likely change as science changes. Um, but for now, for ongoing, uh, if at any time the Northampton Director of Health or Local Board of Health identifies community transmission in the city or surrounding region that has potential to impact one or more schools in the district, they will notify the superintendent and the Director of Health. If it appears that one or more schools are affected um, with a case of transmission rate increase, we will go to remote. Every seven days, the community transmission is reviewed by the JLMC on Wednesdays upon release of the DPH rolling 14-day data. If there is an increase in community case, which is defined as cases, community cases are all cases not encompassed by Northampton residential clusters, we will evaluate the risk to particular schools or the entire district. We will consult with ongoing contact tracing, quarantine, isolation, and communication with our local health department. If cases are appearing to be increasing and more than one school is affected, we will go to remote. If cases are decreasing, we will return back up to the top algorithm and reevaluate differently. If we are seeing an in, increase in cases of residential clusters, and those are defined as cases are inclusive, inclusive of cases who reside in locations where they are unlikely to leave and to have an impact on community transmission. Residential setting examples include nursing homes, skilled nursing facilities, incarcerated and youth residential homes. Employees who work in these facilities who live in Northampton are included in the community case count. As you can see by the diagram, increases in the residential clusters may not have any impact on our schools, so there would be no change. We would continue our current model and hopefully consider increasing students in our buildings. If we have decreased in cases or no change and no community transmission of concern per the local board of health, we will remain in the current model and consider increasing students in the buildings. Safety metrics. Um, will guide the practice on how to mitigate the risk of COVID transmission during any level of in-person learning. Comprehensive safety practices are outlined at the, end of the, at the end of this presentation and may be found on our district's website. There are three critical aspects to risk mitigation, health and safety protocols, physical or social distancing, and ventilation. The JLM feel, JLMC feels strongly that these three areas must be addressed as a whole and encourage the district to engage an engineer to support assessment of view, room of view, room use, excuse me. And as of yesterday, Hesner Engineering Associates have started work. For typical classroom size spaces, an air exchange rate of five or greater is the goal and a minimum of four is considered acceptable. Additionally, all rooms with in-person learning will meet the minimum outside air code from American Society of Heating, Refrigerating and Air Conditioning Engineers, ASHRAE. We recommend modifications to be made to rooms that do not currently meet these standards. Um, as in installing HEPA filter systems, and those will be reviewed by Hesner Engineering Associates. We currently have had 85 HEPA filters uh, delivered and they have arrived in district, and we are expecting a total of 200. Uh, as I said, Hesner began their analysis yesterday and they anticipate having beginning calculations by the end of this week. 
Spaces prioritized that allow room for physical distancing, access to exterior doors, working windows, prioritize access to hygiene, and prioritizing available spaces for the youngest students in the district due to their developmental and educational needs. The second of our two recommendations, with the health metrics in place to pause, halt in-person learning when necessary, and with safety metrics in place to mitigate risk, we recommend to the school committee that the district move to a hybrid phase. Please note, our committee is concerned about the possibility that not all classrooms or spaces are usable at this time and feel strongly that safe spaces for in-person learning should be prioritized for the youngest students. We understand that this may mean an alternate hybrid model that was different um, outlined in our reopening plan. The model submitted to the state had a blend of elementary, middle, and high school students. This hybrid recommendation would be to begin prioritizing younger students at first. Additionally, we commit to update and refining best practice guidelines for implementation of the safety metrics, as in mass breaks, meal times, traffic flow for, with increasing numbers of students, et cetera. Managing the COVID-19 pandemic is a fluid process that requires responsibly and, and responsibly updating procedures and policies. To that end, we will host Dr. Allen, Associate Professor of Harvard, Director of Healthy Building Programs and Deputy Director of Harvard Education and Research Center for Occupational Safety and Health in a conversation specific to Northampton Public Schools. And that will be scheduled for next Wednesday at 3.30. Two members of the JLMC have also sought input from an infectious disease epidemiologist. And at this time, none have been willing or able to attend the meeting due to their workplace restrictions. And if someone becomes available, we will consult with them. I think, Member Kaufman, do you have a question? I don't. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. Though. And um, our work will uh, will be continuing. This is a, a, a living document, a living work group. Um, our focus work will also include considerations for mass breaks and compliance, in particular to meal times, ongoing education and support, and adhering to safety practices for staff, families, and students creative use of outdoor spaces, guidelines for cleaning materials and refining paperwork and procedures as we move along. The next couple of slides show uh, what we have available on our websites already, what work has been done, what is available for review. And I thank you for your time and consideration and everything you do for our district. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Lisa, for that um, presentation. And um, I will, uh, oh, Member Kaufman, you have your hand up. I do, thank you. Um, really, I I just really wanted to share a huge thank you to all of the members of the JLMC um, and certainly um, probably to your families who haven't spent much time with you since this work began. Um, the report itself seems to represent um, the culmination of hours and hours of work and research and sacrifice and I'm sure a compromise. So from the start, we as a school committee really recognize that this was a monumental task involving people with really um, widely varying thoughts and opinions about COVID and what we need to do about it. Um, and also, to be frank, based on really inconsistent reporting and data uh, from all over the place, from our newspapers and our federal government and such. So, you know, despite these um, really high obstacles and high, uh, high expectations, I think you've all done an amazing job. You've done it really well. You've provided us and the Northampton School Committee with two really well researched and well thought out recommendations. Uh, the school committee received these a couple of hours ago, so we all had a chance to read them. Um, really, um, the tireless work and efforts that you've put in on behalf of our school children, their families, 
our educators and our community members is um, incredibly well appreciated. And I just wanted to begin by thanking you, Lisa, and the rest of the team for your uh, great work on behalf of everybody. Thank you. Member Levy. Thanks. Uh, I'll echo the gratitude, and um, Member Kaufman said it well, so I won't say it again, but I, I also very much appreciate the dedication and time put into this. I just have a few questions that I apologize if this was already presented and I just didn't understand it fully. Um, so I appreciate that this model gives us a sense of uh, your recommendation for the hybrid um, or for the hybrid model right now. Um, what, given, given the, the model that you presented, what would need to be in place? And perhaps this is the gray on, on the slide that shows the health metrics which guide any in-person learning. I'm trying to figure out the difference between the green and the gray to the right of that slide. Is the green hybrid learning and the gray fully in-person learning? Or what, if not, what would allow us to understand what would need to be in place to switch from a hybrid model to fully in-person learning? So I think we could use the decision-making tool to help with that decision, looking at the community data. The green and the gray are actually based off the state's um, metrics for um, community being um, low risk. So green and gray are low risk. Okay, I guess what I'm trying to understand is um, what, what makes your recommendation right now that we go to the hybrid model as opposed to the fully in-person model? And if we wanted to provide transparency to our community, how would they know what would be guiding that decision-making to know when these things are in place, then our community will go to fully in-person? So I think once this the safety metrics have been addressed, and Dr. Provost has his hand up to answer. If you want to hop in, Dr. Provost, you're muted, Dr. Provost. You're you're muted, John. Sorry. Um, that's a very practical question. In order to make the move to fully in person, we need to feel that the risk. The community needs to feel that the risk is um, sufficiently moderated that we're able to um, go to social distancing of less than six feet. We probably need to feel comfortable with four feet or three feet in order to go to fully in person, or we just don't have the, the capacity for all of the students. Now, you could then ask, so what would it take for us to feel comfortable with four feet or three feet? Um, so I'll put that one back to Lisa. That's with having all the mitigation strategies in place and making sure people are comfortable with that and having the air quality and flow looked at um, so people feel safe to go back. Okay, thanks. I. I guess my hope is that we could continue to hone that piece of this so that it, we could make that decision not based on feeling, but again, based on science, which I think is, is really the hope of, of this committee. I think it's my hope, I'll speak for myself. It's my hope that we base the, the decisions on the science and not what, whether we feel comfortable. Um, the other, my other question is, can you give us a little bit of information um, just a quick summary about how you landed on the number five in looking at the air quality. So that is based off of an initial conversation that we had with the COO of um, Cambridge Public Schools and um, a meeting that we had watched with Dr. Allen. So Dr. Allen's um, kind of self-judgment for what he would feel comfortable going into a building with if it was his family or his wife. He said four is good, five is better. He would recommend five. Um, so that is kind of where we landed based on okay. that. So we heard some comments and we've heard comments previously um, as a committee that perhaps our numbers are, um, are, are a little bit too stringent that if people wore masks that the numbers wouldn't need to be 
at those same levels. Can you just based on your understanding of the science, can you help us better understand why that number while people are wearing masks or was or was wearing masks not a part of the conversation? Susan, would you like to add your input to that? Sure, I can answer that. Um, wearing masks was absolutely part of the conversation. Um, so these air exchange rates for rooms are a little bit misleading because they clearly depend on the size of the room. Member Voss, what's happening? Go ahead. Is it me? I guess I was also Mayor Narkowitz, so. I have an unstable connection. That's why I keep turning my video off. Maybe okay. I'm. I can't hear you okay right now. I can't hear you, Mayor Narkowitz, but it's Member Voss, I hear you great. Okay. Okay, I'll try again. Um, so, sorry, I need to re-click where I was. So what, these air exchange rates are numbers and they clearly also depend on the size of the room. And what Dr. Allen said in the video we watched that he, he was consulting for the Cambridge School Committee and they had a fairly long question and answer series with him. Um, and it is an interpretation that he was referring to classroom size spaces, but it's pretty likely that's what he was referring to in this conversation. And they said to him um, very specifically, what air exchange would you want to see in a classroom? And he also cited some other work at the beginning of the video, but what he said in answer to that was five, but it would be okay to go to four. And, and that's where those numbers came from. And I think the other thing that's important to know is there's a lot of ways to get there. It doesn't have to say that on what the consultants measure. You can get there with HEPA filters. You can get there with different ways. And what we've really lacked is the expertise of how to get there. And I'm really glad Dr. Provost was able to hire this engineer who seems to be really close to getting us these answers, Well, hopefully well before November 4th. And um, I don't know what the answers are gonna be, but I think the message Dr. Allen sends is there's lots of ways to get more ventilation, but just think about it and do it to, again, mitigate risk moving forward so that we can, as everyone has said, this um, is a pandemic, it's gonna go on for a while and let's figure out how to live with it. But this is a piece of figuring out how to live with it. Um, the other thing while I have the floor is that ASH, the ASHRAE standard is in that same paragraph. And I just wanna clarify some things I heard earlier. What it's saying is that we meet the absolute minimum code for fresh air coming in. So this is before COVID. This is just whatever that absolute minimum fresh air coming into our classroom when there was no COVID. There's no extra because of COVID added to this. So it's a pretty low bar largely because we are wearing masks. And that is a code that's complicated and we need these engineers to help us figure out how to meet it in rooms where it may not be being met. met. But it also takes into account the size of the space. So cafeterias and gyms and bigger spaces clearly have more air in them and need a smaller air exchange rate to have sort of new air for every person in that space. Is that, is that helpful, Member Levy? Very, I really, really appreciate that. Thank you. My, I'll ask one last question because I know I have colleagues who are eager to also ask questions. Um, this is for you, Dr. Provost. Um, given that we've got an engineer who's working with us at this point, I, my understanding is that right now or up till now, there've been a number of classrooms in our schools that we haven't been able to use. Um, because there, because of the air circulation, and so or lack thereof, and so do you, at what? I don't know if you can answer this, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, at what point do you think are we will be able to use all of the rooms that we will need in order to bring our students back into the schools, given given these numbers that have been presented to us and the work that you're doing with that engineer? 
I think the critical component is what member Voss just said about other ways of mitigating air hygiene, which is a term I like to use instead of air quality. Um, Cause this is really about making the air as hygienic as possible, not necessarily removing other kinds of contaminants. Um, if, if we're able to, for example, follow the same rule that they, they ended up in Cambridge, which is that a HEPA filter on high is the equivalent of 2.3 air exchanges per hour. That will bring just about every room in our district up to a usable um, uh, amount of more than four air exchanges per hour. Now I can tell you with, in my conversations with the engineer, who's only been working with us for two days, um, there are other factors that he thinks um, we have already done that may further increase that. Um, we have increased the filtration within our univentilators to MERV 13, um, which he was actually, I would say, surprised that we were able to do that. Um, a lot of ventilation units can't take MERV 13 filters because it's a finer filter, um, but it is capable of filtering out virus. Um, so that is another um, another factor that goes into this complex calculation that member Voss was just talking about. But anyways, the, the, the short answer is if we are able to count all of these mitigation mem measures and quantify them in terms of air exchange equivalents, then I believe that we'll be able to get most of the classrooms in our district up to four air exchanges per hour, which would um, allow us to have the students back in. Thank you. Okay, are, are you all set, Member Levy? Okay, Member Fallon, you have your hand up next. Thanks. Um, so I had two questions and I guess I'll go with the, the issue you were just discussing, um, Dr. Provost, was around the air quality metrics because because I am, I guess I am confused about how simple it is to achieve these numbers. Um, Dr. Allen in one of his articles is quoted as essentially saying, um, you know, it's a simple, like, you know, when people say like, well, we can't improve our air quality as an old building. And he said, like, it's really simple, you know, just opening a window a couple of inches will increase you um, to four or five or six air changes per hour. Um, and that if you change the damper position on your unit ventilators, like it increases it. And um, if you upgrade to a better filter, or if it, you have an interior um, classroom that you know, we, I think we're saying we couldn't use some of these interior classrooms because they have no windows. Um, he's saying that the HEPA filter um, could bring it up to four or five or six changes per hour just using that. And I know that the CDC on their website for how to reopen schools, they right, list I, um... just these very few simple mitigation tools as being enough to bring the air quality in almost all the buildings up to up to standards to open schools. And so I guess I'm just, I, I'm concerned that we put numbers in because um, I didn't see numbers listed in the reopening um, documents for other districts. Um, and so I wasn't sure, like, you know, I know that our buildings the same age as a lot of buildings across the state. And I wanted to be sure that we weren't trying to achieve something that was too difficult. Um, but I guess I'd like to be reassured that, that we're going to accept the expert's recommendation or, or a judgment that yes, by just opening the window or just using this fan or just plugging in this filter that it is in fact safe um, was part one. And part two, um, I know with the DESE recommendation that there was um, someone that you could contact if you had further HVAC questions, did anyone reach out to them? So to take the first question, I, I believe that this is a very conservative recommendation and it's important for the committee to remember that it's just that, it's a recommendation from the JLMC. The committee can accept or reject. Um, you're right that um, Dr. Allen does say that there are other much more simple measures and that he doesn't recommend any magic number. I can tell you that in many of the discussions that I was a part of as part of negotiations, it was said by many people that there wasn't a magic number. Um, but trying to arrive at something that um, 
I felt like I, I believe I would ask Lisa to speak to this, but I think that the JLMC felt like it was important to put some kind of a standard forward. And I think that's how they ended up on the four. But you're right, we have used other of Dr. Allen's strategies already this year. What, prior to the HEPA filtration um, arriving, we were using fans and open windows in order to mitigate airflow in some of the spaces, and that was felt to be safe. And I'll, I'll say this, um, you know, our track record on it has been that it, it has been safe. Um, in, in addition with all the rest of the mitigation measures, the self-checking in the morning, masking, social distancing, all of that has proven to be effective in, um, in preventing spread of the students who we currently have in the, and the staff we currently have in the buildings. Uh, with respect to the other, the DESI expert regarding HVAC, no, we have not, we have not consulted with that person because we were really following um, the JLMC's lead on who they wanted to have for expert um, advice. And I'll just say that any person or any type of person they've asked for, I've approved and we've contracted with. Um, the only the only stumbling block they've had so far is the one that Lisa mentioned, which is uh, the desire for an epidemiologist who could advise the committee. Um, many of them for their own work-related rules are not able to do that kind of work. But um, we've had consultants from Cambridge. We've also had uh, directly from Cambridge Public Schools, we've had the same consultants that the Cambridge Public Schools have used. We've had consultants from the community, and we've had consultants recommended by members of the community. Yeah, I guess it's just, so the only reason I'm asking, because I know that they said if you have questions about ventilation and HVAC systems that you could contact this Matt Denninger. And I guess my question about why we're not just using the DESE guidance and their facility operations guide is there are other districts that have reopened and they're either in a hybrid model or an all-in model, in fact, since September with no cases. Um, and so I guess I'm wondering what standards they use because I would assume that whatever they're using is working. And so I was just kind of curious if, if you, if anybody had reached out to kind of see what standards they were using for comparison um, so that we knew if we were in the same ballpark or not. I can tell you that in my um, weekly meetings with superintendents, the issue of um, air exchange has been uh, a very hot topic. And I, my sense is that most districts have not established a, um, a rigid requirement for air exchanges for education. That's a small group though, and that's basically um, other superintendents from our county and Franklin County. There are a few that have established some ACH requirements, but my sense is that the majority have not. Well, I would be interested to know if DESE has been tracking that data then for districts. I know they're they're tracking everything else, but if they had that information um, for those schools that are reopened, you know, in a hybrid or an all in person, if they know what those numbers are. Um, and also, I was uh, the other question I had was when you said that the only way we could go all in, um, have our students in full time would be if we relaxed from the six foot distance to the three or four foot distance. I guess my question is, um, based on the results of the survey, I'm wondering if, and, and the fact that the state model actually was for students to be all in if this community was in the gray or the green, if in fact half of the community wish to remain remote, would there be space to have those families who wanted to be in just be all in full time and the, half those students who wish to remain remote be remote and not go through the hybrid process? Or would it just never work out that you would have it 50% at every grade and every school, do you think? Well, our, our survey wasn't fine green enough for us to be able to answer that question. We do have another survey that is ready to go out this Friday, which will ask families to make a firm commitment to either return their students to school or not. That is by grade in school, and, and we will be able to answer that question at that time. Um, 
However, I guess I, I also have to say we have to make some allowance for families to change their mind. Um, that was a part of the, the commissioner's call last week. I'll say that one of the things that's um, being experienced across the state is once school reopens, parents who initially said they did not want to have their children attend are then asking to have children attend, which is, as you can imagine, um, really disruptive. Um, it means adding classes. It means reconfiguring bus routes potentially. Um, and so I don't think we should build out a model. And, and the, the advice we've gotten is that if a parent chooses not to return and then changes their mind, we can delay um, having them return to school, but we can't say no. Um, we can probably delay for four to six weeks in order to make the, the planning that we need. But I don't think we could build a model that was at capacity from beginning that didn't allow parents to change their mind later on and come in. So um, the answer I gave you was based on what would be needed for 100% capacity. If it was 50% um, capacity, which it is right now, the six foot distancing might work out fine, but then we may be in a problem, you know, two or three weeks down the road when more families want to have their children attend school. So then we'd be back to the question of, well, can we safely reduce the social distancing within the classroom? Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Ember Gold, you have your hand up next. Yeah, thanks. Can you guys hear me okay? My internet's not the best. Are you able to hear me there, Mayor? Yes, I can. All right. Um, so first, uh, shared thanks uh, to everyone, um, community for coming out to this and uh, for all the efforts of the teachers and through all this the cool committee and also the, the um, JLMC. I did get a chance to sit in on half of the meeting yesterday and greatly appreciated uh, the amount of time and passion that was put into that. Um, and so my, one of my first questions is, and I have a couple, is um, it seems like there's a recommendation to start with elementary um, and prioritize those. Um, why, what is the rationale behind that and not including middle and high? I mean, if it's about building safety and those sort of metrics, um, could someone please describe why would we not start with um, elementary, middle and high in the hybrid? And that could be uh, Ms. Saffron or uh, Dr. Provost, uh, member of OSS, you were there. I mean, anyway, anyone that can answer that one. I'd like some help understanding that. Perhaps Susan. Do you want me to try to summarize what I think I heard? Sure. Sorry, I wasn't sure if you were saying me or you. <laughs> uh, any, I'm saying anyone that can. Um, well, please, other member, please jump in if I if I get it wrong. I think the okay. I might be speaking more for myself and, and Lisa, please jump in if there's other, and there might be other members of our committee on this call. I think um, I've seen some names there. Um, I think the feeling was that Dr. Provost outlined what it was gonna take to start school up, all the planning that has to go into it. And the general feeling was that our youngest learners are for, I think, obvious reasons, struggling the most with the remote learning. And so to start with them and get them back as soon as possible um, and work out kinks along that process and then start um, get, get, figure out what it's gonna take. And I, I mean, I'm not thinking this is taking that long. I'm just saying that's, I think where we were coming from, let's get going with it. But Lisa, is that, is that how you remember that conversation, which has been a yeah, while? In part, and there was also some research that had um, surfaced as far as children over the age of 10 up to adults spreading COVID symptoms more so than younger children. Um, but science changes and that evidence might be changing as well. So that was part of the conversation as well. I, I wasn't part of the, the group, so it's not my recommendation, but I can speak to a little bit of, of, of why it might make sense. Um, as you recall, one of the models that I presented um, in that whole series of models 
did just that. It started with the younger students being back first because of the research, which is a very thin research base, right? We haven't been doing remote learning for very long, but the indications from the research out there were that young learners really struggled um, much as we heard Liz say earlier tonight and are, are, are developing huge learning gaps. Um, so there's, there's that, there's that piece of it. And I would also say just from the results of the survey, which were accurately summarized um, as a very split community, it, there was a pattern when you looked at it by level. Um, the parents of the elementary students definitely showed a stronger desire to be back in person than the middle or high school parents. Um, so there, there are those pieces which I would just add, although, as I said, I wasn't part of developing this recommendation, but I do think those are things that potentially support um, what they're recommending. I appreciate that. I guess um, a follow-up to it, it would be, while I understand like hearing from community and the surveys and all that, I mean, if we as a district feel that we have the facilities and we have the health metrics to let students in the building and hybrid, I guess it seems like we shouldn't limit it to just a third of you know the elementary component of it. I feel like middle and high uh, deserves just as much of an opportunity to have that. I mean, we did hear, um, I thought there was something that you did share also in the survey about like all the students in the high school requesting to be back in high. So that's true. That, that's absolutely true. The students were, um, were very clear that they want to be back in, in school. Um, and I, and I, I, I guess as I understood the recommendation, it was to prioritize young learners, not to stop with them, but to make sure that the process began with them. Along those lines then with the process um, for you in the district, um, is, it, is it easier to just get back, if you were going to just get back elementary first, is it dramatically simpler than if you were trying to get um, elementary, middle, and high back? I mean, is it really something that, if you tried, if you tried getting elementary, middle, and high back, would it take weeks longer than if you just tried getting elementary back? Like, is there a time, uh, difference for you guys. Yes, um, as, as I said from the, the beginning of this process, I need about a month to make a transition. Um, I feel like we're behind where we should have been because of the, the vote being delayed a week. Um, I think that there's a possibility we could start out trying to maintain the original, um, the original timeline that the school committee set forth in its first motion, which was to begin the transition sometime after November 4th, but I don't think we can do it with the entire district at once. Um, I think taking it piece by piece is going to be, um, is going to be much more administratively feasible. One of the things I have to say um, just right now is I can't guarantee a workforce at this point. You know, um, we have I, I told you, I, I believe last week when we met that I had been looking for a week to get a paraprofessional to fill a position at the middle school. I'm still looking for that paraprofessional. Um, so some things need to change um, in terms of what the rules of the road are, but also um, there are a lot of unanswered questions that would make me feel very, um, it would make me feel like I was, I was promising more than I could deliver if I said, yes, we could just get all the students back in hybrid model um, starting next month. I appreciate that. Thanks for the clarification. Um, my second question is, um, Ms. Afron and the team, this is not just to Ms. Afron, but whoever, um, in the background, you shared how much work the pandemic response team was capable of doing, and then how in September, um, there was the vote that added the JLMC to it. I'm wondering what is the what has been the value? What, if anything, has been the value added of it being a JLM and C in its current state than it was when it was just a pandemic response team? Um, is there something that has been that the team has been dramatically able to do differently now because we have more representation on it? Or, yeah, I'm trying to understand that part. So I would say um, the beginning base was more medically sound, which is which was helpful for developing all the policies and protocols. And with the additions of the members from the JLMC, we've had a broader um, we've had a broader knowledge base and people bringing different perspectives and questions to the table. So it opened up conversation 
in a whole different way. Um, I mean, is it, do you feel that we got to a different place? I guess part of my thing is that we're moving forward um, because I've been in the situation where, you know, as I listened last night, um, you know, and I appreciated the amount of effort and work being put in by the JLMC. I also had that same feeling that I do when we're in school committee talking about things that are out of my playing field, you know, like when we're talking about school budgets and all that. I mean, I'm a teacher, but I don't know anything about budgets and all this. So I'm kind of feeling like I'm out of my league when I'm doing that. And I kind of felt in some capacities that some of the, the JLMC might be a, in that situation as well, you know, where you sort of are put in a situation that maybe you're not prepared for. And so um, I wouldn't want, you know, because of the urgency here, I feel like it's most important to get the people who have the knowledge and experience there at the table. And so um, I guess I'm wondering, like, is it worth continuing with the JLMC or moving it back to a pandemic response team is sort of a, a thought. Um, I mean, do you have a thought on that at all? Like if it would, if we somehow as a school committee said, you know what, we're just gonna leave it to a pandemic response team and remove the JLMC, would that, um, it, would that prohibit the good, the, you know, successful work in the future? I don't think it would prohibit any successful work in the future. Um, do I feel that the majority of the team members felt a little bit outside of the box with all the air exchange? Absolutely. So um, this is why we were able to reach out to other folks to get that expertise. Um, so it's just not based on what we think. We need to have what we know. Gotcha. And then, um, so my last question, it goes a couple times through the presentation um, and you guys slides. There's moments where it seems, if I'm not mistaken, um, it says the health director can, based on what uh, the health director sees, call for a temporary close without consulting the JLMC. Is that correct? There are certain situations where they could say we need to close. So that would be Meredith's position. Meredith's position, yes, yeah. right. So, so I guess, and the alternative then, like if she can, if Meredith or the city's health director can make the call to close the schools based on their knowledge and expertise, why is it not enough to allow her to make the call to say, Dr. Provost, you can safely open the schools and increase that? I, you know, I, I, because I, that, you know, I get, I feel like in a way we've maybe built this whole structure where it seems like in the presentation we don't need to if we have someone that we're saying is knowledgeable enough to make sure our kids are safe, why they can't go the other direction also. Is there any thoughts on that one? Well, I, we also um, were in a position where we needed to honor what was negotiated in the MOA as well. So I think we were just trying to find the balance. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, and I appreciate that. And I, I'm asking this just as, you know, I'm a member of the negotiation team and the school committee voting. So I'm just trying to gather all, all those thoughts. And um, yeah, so that's um, all I have for now. And again, thank you to everyone for, for all your efforts through this, for sure. Thank you, Member Gold. I believe we have a member of the JLMC and the pandemic response team um, with their hand raised, uh, Candy Goyette. Candy, did you, something you wanted to add to the Yes, thank you, Mayor Nagowitz. Um, so I just want to say, I just want to like, I've worked through that with the health department contact tracing since March. I'm a school nurse at the high school. Um, I just want to like speak to the numbers and the trends that we've had. Um, Northampton has been in the out of the red since um, early August, and uh, the spread in schools we've had I think 20 cases that we've like referred to for contact tracing and it's all been negative. So I just, I just wanna like, just say that what we're doing in schools is really good and we're being super proactive and we're on top of it. And the, the fact that people have, kids have been back in school for months, kids are, it's, the, the spread is not in schools. So I just wanna say that, like, just like put that data out there that we've had like at least 25, referrals and it's not they're not they're not popping in the schools thank you thank you very much for that um member fallon you have your hand up again 
Thanks. I, only because no one else did, or I wouldn't have raised it again, I swear. Um, I do appreciate, um, Ms. Goyette, you saying that. And, and I was only able to watch the first part of the meeting last night, but I was really impressed with um, all um, Director O'Leary had to say and all the work that you all had done around the, um, the health metrics and um, the rec I respected their the recommendation and guidance you were giving us and that it was very clear that students should be in school. And um, I guess my question, because I had another meeting and I missed the end is, um, Lisa, can you tell us how did it end? Did the committee vote on these recommendations? Was there like unanimous agreement? Does the full committee support these moving forward? Like, I don't really know how this process ended because I had to go to another meeting at seven and I don't know when you all finished, but you were definitely not close to done when I logged out. So oh, it ended um, around 8.15 or 8.20, and I don't know if I ended it in the proper way, but we did review the document um, more than one time and look through the wording as a unit as a whole. And at the end, um, we kind of just adjourned, <laughs> so. But no you, felt, you felt like it had like unanimous support from from every member of the committee as far as all of the recommendations and all of the metrics that were presented? I would say there was a majority. I don't know if it was unanimous. At this point, we're, we've, we're, we're in the regular school committee meeting and we're hearing from school committee members and from members of the uh, JLMC. Um, there's a hand up, but I'm not sure if this is a member of the JLMC or not. Um, so uh, Carolyn, Caroline Bertrand has their hand up, but I'm not sure if this is a, if you're a member of the JLMC, I don't know that, or maybe your hand was left up from the public comment, but we're really just hearing from school committee and from uh, the JLMC at this point. Um, is there any other questions or discussion from the um, school committee. Uh, again, this was just a presentation and, and an opportunity to ask some questions. Um, we'll be taking up the question of the um, uh, potential move to hybrid uh, on Thursday at our, at our meeting on Thursday. Uh, Dr. Provost. Yes, I believe another member of the JLMC has raised her hand, okay. Kate Kelly. Uh, Kate Kelly, okay, uh, Kate, go ahead and um, Good evening. Um, I just wanted to add one more comment um, about member Gold's questions, um, specifically about the structure of the group. I am the newest member of the JLMC PRT um, and come mainly from a strong public health and medical background, um, more than necessarily knowing the interests of that I'm in or um, or the, the safety metrics involving air quality. I've had to be a pretty quick study on that. But I think that your point is um, a good one. And, and at risk of offending any of my um, colleagues on the group, I think it, we need to recognize that within the group, there are several different, very different agendas and self-interests. Um, just because my role as a nurse um, and someone with a strong public health background, my perspective is going to be very different from someone who's representing the union and really is scared about their teachers going back into the building. And so I don't think it's fair to say that there's 100%, whoever asked if there was 100% um, you know, support everybody 100% degrees. I, I would have to say I don't think that's true. Um, but I think that, you know, for example, from my perspective, as someone who worked in pediatric primary care for seven years and is now in the building and is sort of is high risk myself and would love to get my second grader back in the building, you know, my interests are going to be different. Um, and I really would rely strongly on Meredith's suggestions and the public health data, quite frankly, more than the air data, because when there are zero cases in the community, that's very reassuring to me.
but I don't think all the members of the group would agree. I do think that the group came up with a document um, that does reflect pretty much everybody's interests in some way. Um, I think we would, you know, in different individuals may have made edits in other directions. Um, so I just wanted to throw that out there. I kind of feel like there is a bit of an elephant in the room um, based on the fact that we didn't actually, you know, we're new to the public meeting thing and didn't have a vote. I had to leave before the end of the meeting also. But I, I, I want to be honest with you that I don't think everyone on that committee agrees with every single point, but that everyone was able to agree enough. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, for that. Um, Member Kaufman. Thank you. And yes, thank you, Kate. I mean, I, I think that um, that's not unexpected, for sure, with an eclectic mix of folks who, with um, different backgrounds, different interpretations of the data. So again, I commend everybody for whatever compromises they needed to reach. I had personally have no expectation that everybody would come together, but I think you outlined the reality of the situation, the difficulty of people um, you know, being firm in their beliefs and their understandings of the situation. And yet, I, I still am very happy with your recommendations that the team made. So um, I'm, I'm kind of gonna address a couple of questions to Dr. Provost. I, I think that I'm not sure what we need to do next. First of all, did we say that we would vote on the recommendations or not? Or do we need to make a formal uh, vote on whether we accept those or not? Do you, is that your understanding? No, there's a, there's a, um posted meeting for Thursday night with a vote for return to hybrid. So this conversation is important to inform that vote, but there's no vote posted tonight. Right. And that was never the expectation. I didn't think it was. I just wanted to double check. So um, so I think for Thursday, just thinking ahead, um, we've heard some, I think, some really good suggestions tonight for consideration. One is, um, for example, to prioritize the youngest students. And we know that that's probably um, in contradiction to what our current school reopening model is. So some of the questions that I would, I, I wanna ask you Dr. Provost to think about, but also tell us honestly whether, whether you'll be able to respond to this, um, to you, you and your team to come up with this. First of all, what do these recommendations mean for our reopening model? Um, and then what changes do you think we need to consider if we're going to put this into practice. And certainly the, the thing that comes to mind most is the prioritizing the younger kids. But what does that mean overall? And how does that change things? Um, I also think we need a refresher on what this would mean for families that wish to remain uh, receiving their education remotely. Is that going to stay in place? I think the same question for teachers. What does this mean for teachers? Um, not only Will they continue to have the option of teaching just remotely? But um, one of the teachers earlier today, I think eloquently pointed out that our, if we're gonna be asking them theoretically, maybe not theoretically, if we, are we gonna be asking them to teach both remotely and in person? And is that a reasonable ask? I think we need some guidance and some understanding from you and the other education leaders on that. Um, and certainly our teachers are gonna be able to teach remotely and under what conditions? Um, I, that probably is our decision to reach, but it's certainly your recommendation on that and your clarity on that is gonna be important. Um, and I'd also like to know a little bit more about what this will mean for the model that we've had in place so far this year. Um, is there gonna be, in a real practical sense, or is there gonna be, uh, if we voted for hybrid, is there gonna be new teachers teaching kids, both in, per well, in person and or remotely? Where is that change gonna happen? Um, what's going to happen with student schedules, um, particularly if we change the reopening model or there was some calling for kids to come back to school, maybe more than half time. Um, I think there's some evidence that might make some sense these days. Um, so these are the range of questions. You know me, I'll, I'll email them to you later. But <laughs> it just seems like um, we need a lot more information before voting whether to go hybrid or not. And I don't know if that's a reasonable ask for you to address some of these things before Thursday, or whether we just vote on whether to go for hybrid and then we spend and give you the time maybe that you really need to work out some of these questions. 
but there's a, a core number of questions that I think will influence my decision. And I, I think I really need to know the answer to a couple of those. And I can highlight those for you if you want, but I just wanted you to be honest and, and tell us whether you've been thinking about this and whether you'll be, be prepared to answer some of these questions come Thursday or not. Sure. So since I've learned that the JLMC was getting close to a recommendation, I've been working on a presentation and recommendations for school committee that will align with that. Um, so you will receive something tomorrow that outlines some of those questions. Um, I, I'll just say that some of those questions will be unanswerable until we get the result of families firm commitments to return or not return to school. Um, because the, in particular, the question about what we'll be able to do for families who remain remote um, depends on how many families want to remain remote. If, if the majority of families opt for in-person learning, then the reality is that, that we are going to need all staff. I mean, even if, even if it's close to half, we're going to need all staff um, engaged in the hybrid model. So that will, and I, this is in the question and answer guide, I, I believe member Levy asked me about this last week. It does um, diminish the amount of resources that we can provide for remote learning for, for um, grades that are hybrid. Um, the only thing that could change that is if we go to hybrid and a significant number of parents say, no, we would actually like to remain remote. Um, and that I can't answer, but I can't answer how we would stage it. I can, I can answer how we would prioritize the younger learners. I can talk about um, what a rational sequence might look like. And later tonight, um, in executive session, I can share some more thoughts about other things we would need as commit uh, conditions to make this work. Okay, well, thank you. And I, I compliment you for thinking about this ahead of time, uh, not knowing what the result was gonna be. Um, so if you're gonna send us this information tomorrow, then would you be open to us um, sending back some questions that we think would be pivotal for you to think about if you can address them on Thursday? Absolutely. Okay, that'd be great. Thank you again. Member Gold. I see uh, Member Condon. I'll let him go first and because he hasn't spoken yet. Member Condon. Thank you, Member Gold. Uh, just uh, rewinding a bit, uh, I'd like to thank Kate for, for trotting out the white elephant regarding the JLMC and acknowledging that there are some various viewpoints perhaps that are uh, presented on, on that working committee. Um, it seems like the way that committee works and the processes it follows aren't quite ironed out um, by the fact that you know there was no vote on what was presented tonight. I'm just wondering, you know, uh, based on your recommendations, you're going to be meeting every Wednesday to make recommendations about what model we are in. Have have you talked at all about how you're actually going to do that? How is that? How is the committee going to make that decision to deliver to us? So the Wednesday uh, meetings are to look at the state data reports that come that will be coming out and right. to inform the superintendent whether we're going to pause or not pause. And that will be in conjunction with Meredith O'Leary and the Board of Health. So will there be some sort of vote or will there be one person who has kind of the decision making power there on what's presented? Well, the last time we met, it was a vote. So I would imagine we would continue with the vote. Okay, uh, that, that makes sense. I just wanted to make sure that there, there was some sort of clear process. So we, we mm -hmm. going forward, you know, you know how you're gonna be functioning and, and how you'll be delivering that to us. Yep. Thank you. You're welcome. I want to go back to Member Gold. Member Gold, did you want to reclaim your time before? Sure. Got it. Um, so regarding um, the process, is it, um, how do I say this without sounding, we can approve hybrid without approving the metrics. Is that correct from the, these are recommendations. They're not requirements for us to go hybrid. In my opinion, yes. Because I guess a concern I have is um, there's a lot of information in this recommendation and in the metrics. And 
I wouldn't want us having been on the negotiation team. I wouldn't want us to have a glitch where it's not really what was intended by the, it. But when a scenario came up, we were forced into a certain avenue of closing schools because of polio going red. And so, I mean, I'm, I, you know, the last thing I would want to see us do uh, is not value the work that was already done. But at the same time, I don't want to see us get put in a situation where there's a couple of people who have the expertise to make this decision and folks who might be beyond their 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 range of comfort are putting things in there that complicate it. And so I just want to make sure that we all as a school committee know and the public knows that we can approve if we if we vote. It, so there on Thursday, is there a and what member Kaufman was saying, the vote is just for hybrid. It's not to necessarily approve these metrics. Is that correct? There are two related votes on Thursday. One is to adopt the state recommendations for transportation, and the other is to move to hybrid model. Gotcha. All right. Um, I appreciate that. Thanks. That was my little follow-up. Um, I see that uh, JLMC member Candy Goyette has her hand up again. Hi, I just wanted to like clarify that um, as a member of the JLMC, our the pain and response team, and now the JLMC, um, the 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 focus shifted a little bit um, in in early September, and the the our our roles were defined a little bit differently. So I just want to like make that aware of everybody that on the committee that's here that it wasn't a choice of the in the response team of what we we're able to make our recommendations on. It was kind of assigned to us. So I just want to like make that aware that it just shifted. Thank you. That's an excellent point. And that also, you know, relates to the issues that arose around open meeting law because the pandemic response team had been a, an, an advisory body to the superintendent um, up until that point. And then that sort of shifted when it became uh, when when it's then got tied to the, making a recommendation to the school committee. And so that's sort of what got lost in that shift. Um, so thank you. Um, Member Fallon. Thanks. Um, Dr. Provost, can you just tell me, I know that you were saying that families were going to have to make a firm commitment to a model and that you would be able to, you know, delay them if they requested to switch between models. Um, and, you know, we're coming up on the, you know, it's already going to be November by the time you would implement the change. Are you anticipating that that decision that a family makes would be to the end of the school year or to the end of the calendar year? So is it like till January or are they making this decision till June? So we'll be uh i anticipate that we'll be asking families to respond um with a firm commitment sometime over the course of the next week we'll probably send out a, the survey on friday it's currently done it's being translated i've asked the principals to schedule town hall meetings over the course of the next week so that parents have an opportunity to ask questions of what the the actual choice is and what it would look like for them if they if they're unclear on that and then by the end of that last week in october we would need firm commitment um so i would say that for most families um the choice they make at that time would be the choice they have to stay with until the end of december we probably could re reconstruct and um allow for some changing in January, but we're going to have so much going on that we need to be able to plan for the people who say that they wish to return um, and, and not be not be trying to rebuild as we're going along for families that might be changing their minds. Okay, because I feel like the we kind of ran into this when we were trying to pick a date for for when the transition a natural transition would be and I feel like it's a little bit different at the elementary level and the high school as far as the starting dates for for marking periods for semester long classes or year long classes like isn't that going to get really complicated um for students I, who are switching between remote and in person 
Yes, I agree. And the, the plan you'll see tomorrow tries to account for the differences in the elementary, middle, and high school calendar. And I'll be talking more about that on Thursday. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, um, I don't see any more hands. Um, again, just to echo what others have th said, thank you so much to all the members of the JLMC for their work and bringing this forward to us. Um, thank you again to all the members of the public who've come tonight to comment and obviously uh, stay tuned for our meeting on Thursday at 645. Uh, and oh, Member Gold, your hand is up again. Just getting ready to make a motion to move to executive session, whatever you say, go. Perfect, I would accept that motion gratefully. All right, motion to move to executive session, request to enter executive session under Massachusetts General Law, open meeting chapter 30A, section 21A3 to discuss strategies with respect to collective bargaining or litigation if an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining or litigating position of the public body and the chair so determines. Second. Okay, that motion's been made by member Gold and seconded by member Fallon. This requires a roll call vote and I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Member Busanski? Yes. Member Fallon? Yes. Member Serafi Cox? Yes. Member Condon? Yes. Member Levy? Yes. Member Kaufman? Yes. Member Goldman? Yes. Member Voss? Yes. Member Gold? Yes. And Mayor Narquitz? Yes. Okay. So that's unanimous. Okay. So um, the school committee has voted unanimously to move into executive session um, because to have this uh, discussion in open session would uh, put us in a detrimental position with regard to bargaining. I need to let the public know that we will ask everyone now to leave the Zoom meeting who's not a member of the school committee or, or pertinent staff um, and let them know that we will not um, come back into open session. So we'll adjourn directly from uh, the executive session. So you won't miss anything in open session. Um, you don't need to stick around to, to wait for us to come back because we won't come back. We'll adjourn directly from executive session. So. Um, thank you again all for attending, and I'll now wait while the, um, while the Zoom meeting clears out so that we can begin the executive session.